listening to the Steve Shram Show. Good to see you this week, and we're excited to come to you this week to talk to you a little bit about morality and the grounding for morality. What does it uh, mean to hold to something like objective morality, especially with respect to being a Christian versus being an atheist or being an agnostic? What kind of foundation exists for morality on these different views, and what version of morality is acceptable uh, given the truth of any one of these views. Well, that's what we want to discuss with you today and give you an idea of what it means to have metaphysical grounding for something, and then we're going to take a couple questions. We're excited to dive in. All right, all right, all right. Well, hey, it is episode number 94 here on the Steve Schramm Show. We're inching closer and closer to 100, and I just want to say thank you. If you are somebody who's been listening for a long time, thanks for hanging out with us for a long time and allowing me to uh, get to speak truth into your life each and every day week. I am thankful for that opportunity. I don't take that opportunity lightly. And I just hope and pray that you would help me to do a better job. Uh, If you have any feedback for me, you can always feel free to email me, steve at steveshram.com. If you have topics you'd like addressed or you have a specific question, especially, that we can help you out with, I would certainly love to hear that from you so that we can make this show as good as possible for those who take the time to listen. So we, again, thank you for your participation and uh, are just so excited to to come to you and have your ear for yet another week. Well, what I want to talk about for a few moments before we dive into some questions is this idea that moral facts must be grounded. Moral facts must be grounded. So I was in conversation with uh, a gentleman who self-professes to be an atheist, and he was taking upset, uh, excuse me, exception with the moral argument as traditionally formulated by, say, William Lane Craig. And so we were talking a little bit about that. And uh, to be honest, our conversation is not over. I have yet to get back to him uh, in, in our conversation. So the ball is on my back. I need to get back to him. But, or the ball is in my court. I'm mixing analogies this morning. But so the last kind of thing that we had got to in our conversation was this concept of grounding. Why is it that something like objective morality is true? Uh, why, why not relativistic morality? Why not subjective morality? Why not have morality that is grounded in the subject of um, in, in question? So in my feelings or your feelings or my uh, convictions versus your convictions, why have morality that is rooted in anything deeper than that? Um, and when we want to affirm that kind of morality, what implications does that have? In other words, whose worldview makes sense of that kind of thing? Now, over the last few years, I would say 20, 30 years, I would say that there is a bit of a cultural shift on this point. Now, to be sure, there are your fair share of relativists still out there, but the general trend that I encounter today is that many people want to affirm a sort of objective morality, even if they don't want to outright admit it. And ironically, this is the insight that led William Lane Craig to actually end up formulating his moral argument for the existence 
of God. And the way he tells the story, he was going around um, on college campuses, spending a lot of time speaking about why it matters whether or not God exists. In other words, the absurdity of life without God. And he assumed uh, throughout this project that relativism was the prevailing view. But over and over and over, he kept finding that people wanted to affirm objective morality, even if they didn't want to outright say that, yes, there is a such thing as objective right and wrong. They objectively thought it was rude or intolerant, or whatever have you, to um, force their particular view on others. Well, of course, this is just another uh, kind of way of saying the same thing. This is They objectively believe that it would be intolerant of them, even though they might have these definitions wrong, to try to persuade other people with their particular Viewpoints, And of course, there's a lot going on there that is problematic. But the point is that they wanted to affirm objective morality in their, um, in their actions. And so what Craig realized is that what these folks were doing was actually providing a second premise and a kind of moral argument for the existence of God. And if you're not aware of, of, of that argument, of course, it's just um, basically if God does not exist, then objective uh, moral values and duties do not exist objective moral values and duties do exist therefore god exists and so it is this moral argument that um has premises that require defending uh don't get me wrong you you don't get to just assert the argument you have an argument and and then you have to defend the truthfulness of the premises so the first thing you have to do is defend um the notion that if god does not exist objective moral values and duties do not exist and then you have to defend the notion that objective moral values and duties do indeed exist so uh, that is uh, how the standard argument is is typically run now when we look at these moral facts. I guess what we're really talking about today is the existence of moral facts. And that would be the uh, defense, essentially, of the second premise of Craig's moral argument. The very premise that was actually supplied by these folks that um, Craig encountered on these campuses. So the person who wants to deny that uh, moral facts exist would have to deny that it was wrong for them to assert their views or to leverage their views against somebody else. So it would be wrong for them, objectively wrong, for them to think that it was objectively good for them to be tolerant, for example. Okay, so you see the problem that is arising here. It's really, really hard to deny objective morality. And that's the point that I want to get here, is these moral facts are really along the lines of what philosophers would call intuitions, okay? An intuition in a philosophical sense is a little bit deeper than uh, what we think of today as just a, a gut feeling or something like that. In philosophical terms, it's more carries the idea of something being so obvious to you that to deny it, you would have to make other assumptions that are less obvious than the existence of those intuitions, themselves. In other words, the intuition that it is objectively wrong to torture babies for fun. It's an extreme example, but sometimes in our cultural climate, you have to make these kinds of examples to be able to get your point across. Um, And the point is that if even one thing is objectively wrong, 
obviously objectively wrong in every uh, sense, then objective morality exists. And we have to distinguish here between ontology and epistemology. In other words, we have to distinguish between whether or not something really is right or wrong and whether or not we know or even can know whether something is right or wrong. So by using an extreme example, it's not meant to have any kind of uh, trickery or anything like that. The extreme example is just an obvious appeal to something that uh, the maximum number of people can understand in terms of analogy. We all agree. We have to. We all agree that objectively it is wrong to torture babies for fun. This is a moral fact, a moral intuition. And I wrote down two things about these uh, facts that help us to know um, about them, um, help us to understand the nature, I guess I should say, of these facts. First is that they're plausibly undeniable. Plausibly undeniable. Um, to deny, to deny that it's objectively wrong to torture babies for fun, for example, is just the height, it seems to me, of immorality. It's, it would just be ludicrous. It would be ridiculous to say that that's merely wrong subjectively, that it's merely your preference that babies not be tortured for fun. It seems to me that we want to say something stronger than that because we believe something stronger than that. Okay, now, when we're being philosophically careful, we can use uh, fun, uh, um, um, you know, politically correct kind of language to get our point across in a way that doesn't commit us to any particular view. But inevitably, like the uh, uh, beach ball illustration of Sean McDowell's that I love so much, you can push down that beach ball as much as you want to, clothing it in nice philosophical language, but at the end of the day, you really believe you really believe in your heart of hearts as, as deep of an intuition as possible that it's objectively wrong to torture babies for fun. And that means it's plausibly undeniable that these kinds of moral facts exist. The second thing I'd say about them, and, and this is related to that first point, is that they're properly basic. They're properly basic. In other words, they're just, they're so they're so obvious to us that their truthfulness does not depend on argument. In other words, one does not need to argue from premises to a conclusion that it is objectively wrong to torture babies for fun. It's a a basic uh, belief. For something to be a, a properly basic belief would just simply be to say that it is true. That it is a basic belief to us that it is objectively wrong to torture babies for fun. Now, we're not talking about wrong in the sense that uh, evolution has tricked us into thinking it is wrong. We're not talking about wrong in that it is um, for the greater good of humanity, that humanity survives and therefore for one to torture uh, a baby for fun uh, would be a waste of a human life because it doesn't go towards the uh, advancing of the human race. We're not talking about all that. All of that stuff is subjective morality. It is subjective morality that people have tried to uh, place into this objective position, but they've only done this by misunderstanding what it means, um, misunderstanding the distinction between objective and subjective. Okay, objective is wrong regardless of what anybody thinks about it or feels about it. It has nothing to do with what I think, with what you think. It is completely a question of ontology. It's a question of being. It is objectively wrong to rape a woman. It is objectively wrong to torture babies for fun. These kinds of things are objectively wrong. It is objectively wrong to take an innocent human life without proper justification. These are the kinds of things that are moral facts. They're moral intuitions that are so obvious to, the, to us that to deny them would be 
detrimental. Now, here's the awkward part. It's pretty obvious that we have these things. Now, what accounts for them? What kind of thing can, even in principle, ground a moral fact? Can atheism? Can agnosticism? Can theism? Grounding, according to Christian philosopher Ben Holloway, he's got a nice article online on this, and I really like the way he puts it, so I'm just going to bring this to you here. A metaphysical grounding claim explains or accounts for an apparent fact. Okay, let me say this again. A metaphysical grounding claim explains or accounts for an apparent fact. We've already argued that it's an apparent fact that uh, moral facts and moral intuitions uh, are just that, are plausibly undeniable and properly basic facts. Now, what kind of thing in principle can ground a moral fact? When we're looking at worldviews, we have uh, a few from which to choose. But speaking very, very broadly, we could look at atheism, who atheists, uh, traditional atheists, would affirm the proposition God does not exist. Okay? So these are people who do not believe that God exists. And then agnostics, these are folks who don't know, they legitimately do not have an opinion one way or the other as to whether or not God exists. And then theists, of course, do believe that a particular kind of God exists. Now, it seems to me that on atheism and on agnosticism, there's nothing that can ground these moral facts. How, if there is no objective standard beyond the human being, beyond the human race, how can these things possibly be objective? Well, it seems to me that they just can't. There's no reason to think that on atheism there is some sort of greater overall purpose. Uh, remember, um, in order to show that moral facts are something uh, that exist, you have to affirm two things. You have to be willing to say that something uh, in our, uh, what we're talking about here is human life, is valuable, that it has objective value. And then you have to be able to show that it is dutiful, in other words, that you have a, a, a duty to treat the thing as if it is valuable. So it's understanding good and bad, right and wrong. If something is good versus bad, that's a question of whether or not it is valuable. If something is right versus wrong, it's a question of whether or not you have a moral obligation to act on that particular duty. Now, that these moral facts exist does not depend on those two things. But when it comes to grounding them, when it comes to accounting for them, we have to be able to assign value and to assign objective duty. And on atheism and agnosticism, I see no argument for either one. I can, I can find no argument for the value, the objective value, the objective meaning of human life. And neither can I find, therefore, any duty that we have to act on any apparent values that exist, even if we granted for the sake of argument that humanity was somehow intrinsically valuable on atheism. We'd have no duty, based on that fact, to treat human beings as if they are valuable. But on Christianity, on theism, yes, but on Christianity specifically, we have uh, very specific things included in our worldview that allow us to affirm these deep moral intuitions. They allow us to affirm the value of human life, and they allow us to affirm in virtue of God's uh, command to us why we have a objective duty to treat other humans as though they actually are valuable as it 
seems. So I want to agree with the atheist and the agnostic and the uh, non-theistic religionist who want to make the world a better place. I, I want to agree with those people who want to help uh, the starving children in third world countries who don't have access to the resources that we have. I want to uh, join hands and lock arms with those folks who build schools in some of these developing countries so that they may have access to the kind of education that we have to, to better those worlds. But the question I have to ask those people is, whereas I have a reason for that, I've got justification for that, what grounding, what reason, what philosophical justification do they have for that other than it's just a good idea or it makes them feel good for having done it? There's nothing. There's nothing objective. So I want to lock arms with them and say, yes, let's do these things, but I also want to offer them a worldview that makes them reasonable and makes them sensible. And I think that we have something, we have a worldview that can offer just that, the grounding claims in the existence of the Christian God. Right back after this short break. One of the ways you can contribute to the work we do here at Steve Schramm Ministries is to consider gifting us a monetary donation towards our annual ministry fund. You know, it does cost money and time and resources in order to be able to create high quality materials like our weekly podcast, the articles that we put out from time to time, and the videos that we create often and put on our Facebook and on our YouTube channel. Would you consider prayerfully becoming a partner with us in ministry? If so, just go to steveshram.com slash give. That's steveshram.com slash give. There you will see some different options on how you can partner with us and what benefits there are to you. And we certainly appreciate in advance any time that you would take to prayerfully consider becoming a partner with us either in financial donation or simply in the donation of your prayers for our ministry. So head to steveshram.com slash give and find out how you can help today. All right, well, we want to return now to a couple questions that we have. And these questions actually do both come from Quora this time. Uh, We mentioned a few weeks ago that we were going to be taking some questions from different places and if questions come in we'll answer them and uh, otherwise we'll go grab some questions from Quora because people on Quora actually ask, uh, believe it or not, some very insightful questions. They're not the kind of standard fair questions that you get, actually. And so I, uh, well, of course, some of them are. But in in this case, uh, I'm able to find some pretty good ones, usually, uh, within the Christianity section. So found a couple that I think will be useful for us to uh, consider. This first question goes like this. Uh, They qualify it. They say, this is a genuine question for Christians. If there is no scientific evidence for a Christian God, or any God for that matter, then what makes you continue to be faithful? If there is no scientific evidence for a Christian God, or any God for that matter, then what makes you continue to be faithful? Now this is a a good question, and um, given the person the benefit of the doubt, they, they state that it is a genuine question, so I'm going to assume that it is. And it, it just kind of goes to show the misunderstandings that abound when it comes to these kinds of uh, metaphysical discussions. And it also goes to show how ingrained so many of our culture um, uh, or how much of our culture is in scientism, in this idea that only the hard sciences get to weigh in on important issues. So this person, this person is asking for scientific justification for a historical claim. They want scientific evidence for a historical 
claim, okay, the existence of, uh, of, of God in terms of biblical revelation is a historical claim. Now, one could also state it this way, but they're asking for scientific evidence, physical scientific evidence. Science is that which deals with the physical for a metaphysical claim. God's existence would be a metaphysical kind of reality, not a physical kind of reality, because God is a transcendent mind. Okay, now, so the question, if there's no scientific evidence for a Christian God, well, let's just, let's just start with that part. There are a couple things that are going on here. First of all, there does seem to be some question begging. Yes, it uses the word if, but the 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 way the question is worded to me, it seems like they're saying since there is no scientific evidence for a Christian God, what makes you continue to be faithful? That's how it seems like the question is coming across and if that's the case, then this is just simply a question begging question. Now, there's a name for that. It's called a complex question. That is, it's a question that wants you to answer, but the premise, the assumption, the foundational assumption that the question has to uh, make uh, simply assumes the um, what, what the person is trying to prove. Since there's no scientific evidence for a Christian God, they, in other words, they've got their conclusion. That's what it sounds like to me. So if that's the case, then uh, then we have question begging happening here. But secondly, as we've already at least alluded to, we have a category mistake. It's a category mistake to ask for scientific evidence for the existence of God. Because God is a metaphysical reality, not a physical reality. The Bible specifically states that God is spirit. God is a spirit. So what we have to do is look at what the Bible actually says about the nature of the uh, God that we are arguing for, the Christian God, and use those assumptions when we come to the table to be able to know what kind of evidence would qualify as proper justification for belief in such a God. Now, it is true, as I've mentioned, that there is no such thing as scientific evidence for God. That is a category mistake. However, science does provide evidence for the existence of God. In other words, modern science, let me word this carefully, modern science can be used to support to excuse me to support premises within arguments for the existence of God. I think a great example is uh, uh, William Lane Craig. That name comes up a lot, doesn't it? Um, his Kalam cosmological argument. Now he supports the second premise that the universe began to exist with a couple of scientific justifications. Now, one of those I disagree with, his use of the Big Bang, okay? Um, I think that if a Big Bang happened, it's, exist it's, it's evidence for the existence of God. If a Big Bang happened, it's scientific evidence for the second premise of this argument, which shows logically that God exists, Um more modestly, the argument actually shows uh, that um, the universe has a cause. But then when you reason to the nature of what that cause would have to be, given the rest of the argument, you arrive at what everybody um, would call God. Okay, so understanding this, that I don't agree uh, that, that a Big Bang happened. I am a young age creationist. I do not think the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, and I do not think the uh, universe is 13.8 billion years old. But that notwithstanding, that's the way that Craig uses the argument. And if I was inclined to accept that, then I think it would be a legitimate argument to use that. However, Craig does provide a second scientific evidence that I am uh, happy to 
uh, uh, go along with, and that is the laws of thermodynamics. Craig argues from the laws of thermodynamics that the universe has a definite beginning sometime in the distant past. And I can totally get on board with that. Now, this is not scientific evidence of God, but it's scientific evidence that supports a premise in an argument that leads to the inference that God exists. Science can show that the universe began to exist, and that means it must have had a cause. And from there, we can reason to the nature of that cause. So, uh, understanding how science can be used Science can never, especially within the uh, context of showing things that happened according to the Bible, science can never be used magisterially to magistrate over how we understand things about our worldview in terms of um, dictating them, but it can be used ministerially. That is, we can come alongside with science and use the claims and use the methodologies that we find in modern scientific research to um, to support our views. Uh, a good example of that would be we don't use science to um, influence our biblical interpretation of a global flood. We get the global flood from our interpretation of Scripture. But we can use science to create models based on statements that we find in Scripture that would help us to understand the physicalities of how such a flood might have happened. And that's exactly what flood theorists do. And because of that, all we can commit ourselves to is the biblical data. We can't say for sure which model is right. Each model of a flood has strengths. Each model has weaknesses. The reality is that we can use these different models, though, to understand how the claim of what took place in the Bible is reasonable. So that's another way that we can use the scientific evidence to support arguments that would lead to the inference that God exists, even though the question, the way this person asked it, which is a common kind of thing, um, begged the question in the question and was also a category mistake. So maybe that will help you as you're answering different people when they ask for scientific evidence for God. You can help clarify to them that it's not really scientific evidence you're looking for because science proper deals with the physical world, not necessarily with the metaphysical world, although it can lead, as in with also the inference from intelligent design, it can lead to inferences and uh, conclusions that something metaphysical is going on. Okay, uh, another question that came through on there was this. How was Satan allowed to tempt Christ when he was in the desert for 40 days? Didn't Christ, being the Son of God, have power over, over evil? Let me read that again. How was Satan allowed to tempt Christ when he was in the desert for 40 days? Didn't Christ, being the Son of God, have power over evil? Uh, you know, I really thought this was a great question and another one that, that kind of came across as being um, genuine. How is it that uh, Jesus could be tempted in this way? We have uh, a God who is all-powerful, who dominates over evil, who, according to our very Bible, will one day um, punish Satan himself in everlasting uh, torment. He is only allowed to rule over this world for a period of time, and he doesn't do anything that is outside of the sovereign will and control of God. So how then does he tempt Christ? after he had been in the desert for 40 days. Well, I wrote down a couple of things that I think might be helpful to you. First of all, uh, would just be to understand God's program. Understand God's uh, overall program. God sent this 
Savior into the world, the second person of the Trinity, took on a human nature. He added a human nature to his divine nature and came and suffered as a man because only a God-man could accomplish what needed to be accomplished in order for our sins ultimately to be forgiven. I forget who the, uh, I think it was a church father who said something along these lines, but one of the most eloquent ways that I've heard it said is is this, the sin debt that, that we've incurred is something that only man owes but only God could pay. Only man owes, but only God could pay it. And so it took a God-man. And as you read the New Testament, as you read the life of Jesus, and you begin to see what kinds of things, and you reflect on it a little bit, uh, would be required of this God-man. It's easy to see how, uh, because uh, he was tempted, because he, whatever the, the calculus of that works out to be, which I'll mention something about that in a minute, however that works out to be, we can glory in this. We can thank God for this, that we have not an high priest, the Bible says, who is not touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, and yet without sin. We have in Christ, somebody who took on a human nature and lived the perfect, sinless human life to become that sin offering for us and to have that even in the legal transaction that imputed sin so that God could impute his righteousness to us. So understanding how God's program works all throughout the big picture will help us understand why things uh, like this that prima facie might seem difficult need to happen. Um, and then uh, to reflect a little bit on the nature of Christ and the uh, kenosis of Christ. Now, these are big theological things, but uh, essentially the kenosis uh, is the emptying of Christ. And of course, the nature of Christ, understanding how it is that you can have a God in man or a, a, a God man, somebody who, as the Chalcedonian formula, I believe, puts it a, a, uh, a truly God, truly man, very God, very man. Now, a lot going on here, but uh, I'm probably at this point most apt to um, adopt, uh, again, the view that William Lane Craig uh, argues for on this point, which would be that the subconscious of Christ um, had kind of this di the divine uh, nature in it, that the divine nature of the second person of the Trinity occupied the subconscious mind of Christ, but that the conscious mind of Christ was indeed that human nature. And so this would uh, allow for Christ to, of course, be the Son of God. He legitimately is the second person of the Trinity. But part of that kenosis, that was the laying aside of his glory, the temporary laying aside of some of his divine um, uh, abilities. I hate to use that word. Uh, some of his um, uh, divine rights, even. Um, temporarily, putting those into the subconscious mind of the Christ and the conscious mind being that of the human nature. And thus he could have power to live in the human nature, a sinless, perfect life, and yet be confronted with many of the same trials and temptations indeed that we are. Uh, this is uh, a way that we can understand how Christ uh, was able to learn things, how Christ was able to uh, develop over time and not just simply be uh, a baby laying there in uh, um, um, the uh, uh, manger or as he's growing up and, and have this awareness that he is somehow the second person of the divine 
Trinity by placing the locus of the divine nature within the Christ in the subconscious mind. We can see how we can have a a person, a single person, who has two complete natures as the Chalcedonian formula wants to affirm, a divine nature, a 100% divine nature, and a 100% human nature working in concert. And we can see how things like these episodes of Satan tempting Christ, etc., go through, even though Christ is the Son of God who has power over evil. So understanding God's program, understanding the nature of Christ, and understanding the kenosis of Christ, in other words, that that emptying, understand, understanding in what ways God emptied himself when he took on human flesh. Understanding those things will help us to get at these scenarios that otherwise seem difficult. Well, I, thank you for joining us this week. Why don't we close out our time today with a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we love you and appreciate you. We're, we're so thankful, Lord, for your sending Christ to this world to take on human flesh, to take on that human nature and live that perfect, sinless life that he might be the propitiation for our sins. Lord, we uh, love you and we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your program that allows us to enter into your grace. We thank you for the opportunity to answer these questions and to, to get at some of these difficult topics and help other believers to be able to have confidence in what they believe so that they may be more effective witnesses as they share their faith and uh, more confident Christians as they seek to live out their faith in this harsh world. Father, we love you. Thank you for your goodness, for your grace, and for your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, Again, we want to say thank you for hanging out with us. We're excited to uh, come to you next week with another great uh, set of topics. I'm not entirely sure what we're going to talk about next week yet, but I hope you'll pray for us as we prepare for next week and as we aim to come to you with uh, helpful truth to help you defend your faith with confidence. Hey, real quick, if you're looking for a speaker to come to your church, to your event, etc., to talk about some of these topics, you can go to steveschram.com slash speaking. We've got a whole list there of our most popular sermons that we love to come out and do. So um, it would be our honor if you would invite us in. We only go where we're invited, uh, as Greg Kogel likes to say. Uh, I can't show up somewhere uninvited. So um, if you would like to have a speaker come in and address your church on these topics theology apologetics creation something of that nature then feel free to reach out steveschramcom slash speaking i would love to see you there all right thanks so much again we'll see you next week Bye-bye.